Treasuries are up again today. That's mostly due to the stronger than anticipated retail sales, coupled with the whole slew of information that's coming out this week. Let's not forget the war in Israel. Now we're fighting multiple wars, apparently, or supporting multiple wars. So all of this has is kind of like a perfect storm for treasuries. And, um, you know, the economy seems to keep doing a little better than we thought. That said, the five-year treasury today is at 4.85%. The 10-year treasury is at 4.82%. And the two-year treasury is at 5.21%. So you can see those numbers are going up pretty high. That two-year treasury is actually a high that we haven't seen so far. So we've reached a new high, at least for this time period. I would have to go back and check all the information to see how many years exactly uh, this this is a high uh, for. But let's just say, guys, it's going dangerously close. The five and the 10 year are dangerously close to that 5% mark. If we do that, that would be the first time since the great financial crisis uh, that we've seen treasuries in that 5% range for the five year and the 10 year treasury. So, so those retail sales, they came in 0.7% above which is above the estimate of 0.3% that was forecasted. So that was actually quite a bit stronger than we were anticipating. So you saw those treasuries spike today after that data. Now we have lots of data and Fed talks this week. Wednesday, we're getting uh, housing starts and building permits. Thursday, we'll get initial jobless claims and existing home sales. Uh, and like I said, the Fed's going to be speaking all week. They're basically going to be priming us for uh, whether or not they plan to hike, hike rates. So it's really important to listen to what they say or at least read the news to get the recap of what they're saying because some people are forecasting another rate hike in light of better than expected economic data uh, that's coming out. While other economists still think that the Fed's done with rate hikes, given that the sharp rise in Treasury with the 10 year getting so close to 5% is kind of doing all the heavy lifting for the Fed. One thing we can be certain of, though, is that we're going to expect higher rates for longer. So that's what the Fed's been saying all along. Is that six months? Is it nine months? Is it 12 months? Is it 18 months? We don't know, uh, but it is higher for longer. So it's not like rates are dropping um, at the beginning of the year. <laughs> for example, there is no forecast uh, that rates will be dropping at the beginning of the year. So you can expect probably for six plus months that we're going to have higher rates. Um, that said, lenders have a huge margin right now. And I keep talking about that, but it is kind of egregious. It's sort of like, you know, how we have had inflation and now all these businesses are not only are they having to pay higher wages, but to some degree, they're just raising prices because they can. Um, they've maybe had some shipping costs have been going up everywhere, but it's caused this domino effect of everybody to raise prices. Um, so until people start scaling back, we're going to keep seeing that. And we're seeing that everywhere. Now, I've seen groceries start to come down slightly. But then again, it's kind of uh, gas has gone up so much higher, especially now with the, the war in Israel, it's gone up even higher. So we're just seeing inflation still creeping in in other areas, getting better in some, but getting worse in others. Um, but that said, I was curious to know the exact data on how multifamily has been affected by the already increasing rates. So I dove into the data. Now, nationally, on a 12-month basis, September sales activity registered the first print below 100 billion since 2014. That's down 69% from a staggering 316 billion that traded in the 12-month period ending in 2022 Q2. This is according to the National Multifamily Housing Risk Report from CoStar Market Analytics. Now, in the San Diego market, multifamily sales of five to 100 unit property activity was down 38.3% in 2022, and now we're down another 54% year over year in 2023. While, this is interesting, total listings are up sharply this year compared to 2020, 2021, and 2022. That's a sign that there's still a gap between what buyers are willing to pay and what sellers are willing to sell for. It's also interesting because the residential market, all we've been hearing is that we have super low inventory, not enough housing, not enough building to even um, cure this housing issue. While on the 
opposite hand, we have multifamily listings kind of just sitting on the market and a high at a higher level than we've seen in the last three years. Uh, probably even more. I didn't go back that much farther. So what I'm seeing is that these listings are are sitting on the market mainly because people can't get the returns they're looking for. Like I said, that gap between what buyers are willing to pay and sellers are willing to sell for is still like they're not filling this gap. Now, I heard a national number. I haven't verified it, but I heard that the average uh, spread between buyers and sellers right now is about 11 percent. Who knows? It could be more in San Diego because our cap rates just haven't really gone up, uh, definitely not at the pace of interest rates. So the average market cap rate in San Diego County is 4.42%. Now that's for buildings that have sold this year. That's compared to 4.18% a year ago. Now this captures A, B, C, and D properties and locations. It's all of San Diego County. But while interest rates for multifamily debt are up around 6.8% today. That's up from 4.625 in September, 2022. So you can see what I mean here when I say that cap rates have gone up maybe 25 basis points, not quite, uh, but interest rates have gone up almost a full 2% uh, since this time last year. So the also the final sale price versus the asking price is down 7.8% this year meaning that the property was listed at this level and the buyer ultimately bought 7.8% below list uh, price. So who's active in this market? Well, I'm still seeing some flippers who are active in the market buying smaller properties. And when I say smaller, I'm seeing more activity in that kind of below $3 million mark. A lot of people are paying cash. Some are getting private money. Some are getting traditional debt. Not many, though, because it's really affecting loan dollars. I mean, if you're going to buy a property that's at a five cap today and you're going to get an interest rate of 6.8 for that debt, you probably need to come in with a minimum of 50 percent down maybe even 60 or 70 percent down. So the numbers aren't pretty. There is still bridge financing available. So a lot of people who are buying the value add type product have to get bridge financing. But even at that, unless they're extremely experienced and they have really tight relationships with their lenders where they've done multiple deals with them over a period of time, over the last few years, five years, 10 years, whatever, um, most lenders are capping you at 65% loan to cost. Now I'm talking about five plus unit apartments uh, for residential, they get a little bit more aggressive if you're experienced. So basically properties over $3 million are getting very little activity. And that's primarily due to the cost of borrowing and the down payment needed, right? Because if you're a cash buyer, some people have a ton of cash, but not everybody has millions of dollars to come to put down on a property, nor do they want to when they can just park it in T-bills for a while and gain five and a half percent interest with no federal tax. So um, there are some benefits to that right now. A lot of people are being patient and waiting and waiting for that gap between what they're willing to pay and what sellers are willing to sell for to, to close. Private money lenders, though, are getting access to more quality deals than they were getting in the red hot market we've been in post pandemic. So they're able to get pickier on deals. So some of the deals that I'm seeing, you know, that would have gotten done two years ago by a private money lender, they're not doing today because why? Because they're picking from quality deals that would have otherwise gone to banks had there been competitive financing available. So they're more apt to lending on that borrower who makes really good money, that has great credit on more of a typical multifamily deal rather than going to that kind of first time investor who might not have great credit or great experience as an example, or maybe there's something funky about the property so I am seeing that uh, private money lenders are a little bit more picky because they can be. So what I'm seeing too with our bankers, like some of our smaller, more local lenders are coming in and out of the market. So basically when they want loans, they drop rates. And then when they get busy again, which is really loose term, uh, they raise rates, meaning that a lot of our banks are kind of running on skeleton crews where like people um, finally retired. <laughs> They're like, I'm to heck with this market. I'm retiring uh, finally. And they just never refilled the position, obviously, because they're anticipating the slowdown and that we're currently in a slowdown. So uh, when I say busy, that is a really relative term, meaning that they're running on a really tight crew. They can handle a handful of um, deals or like a small, smaller volume of deals. Uh, but it's just enough to kind of like, you know, keep some 
keep them making some money, keep them doing some deals if they want to be doing them. Uh, so the general consensus across our lenders is that they're seeing some activity, but they're experiencing lots of fallout due to a wide range of reasons. Now I'm talking about purchases. So it, those reasons could be anywhere from someone losing their job to a seller not accepting a price reduction or the buyer just getting cold feet, whether their their loan got more expensive, the property wasn't in the condition they thought it would be. Um, our busiest lenders are actually busy doing loan assumptions. That being said, some of our more cautious lenders aren't even allowing assumptions unless the new buyer is stronger than the current guarantor. So if you have a loan that's set to adjust soon, you need to carefully read your loan agreement. For one, the assumption language is generally super vague in your loan docs, meaning that it's really up to the lender's discretion. And that's kind of all they say. Uh, some other lenders have more specific assumption wording in there, but you know, they're all going back to their legal to seeing to see what they can do even on that. So one of my lenders, for example, said um, they had purchased another bank three or four years ago. That bank, their loan docs had assumption language in it. Their assumption language basically just says it's up to the lender's discretion. Now, for those loans that had the assumption language, they already spoke to their attorney and their attorney basically said you can make it very difficult, if not impossible, for somebody to assume this loan because there's a lot of loopholes and workarounds. So I'm seeing that with some of our lenders. So if you are considering listing your property, you want to make sure to read that loan agreement. And not only that, reach out to your lender. If I did your financing, you can call me. I'm happy to be the bridge between uh, you and the lender to get whatever we can get them to agree to. But I will tell you, they're not making concessions. We have tried everything from the seller will deposit money with the bank and keep it on deposit for a while to the buyer will deposit money and keep it on deposit for a while to um, what if we take a 1% higher rate to what if we pay a higher fee? There's all these things that have been proposed on uh, recent loan assumptions for certain lenders who are not accepting them in this market. And we have not won on any of them simply because they'd rather have you pay off your 3% loan or 4% loan uh, so they get that capital back in. In, uh, their possession. So, um, you know, it's tough. The other thing that I'm also seeing right now is, you know, I've talked to a lot of clients in the past and we've had this conversation about, you know, their loan set to adjust. So let's say you have a five-year fixed, it's coming uh, it's set to adjust next year. And you're thinking, look, I'm just going to sit back and let the rate adjust. I mean, there's caps, right? There's a 1% rate cap. So if it goes up or up 1%, I can handle that. It's still lower than the rate that I would get today. Well, be careful. You want to read that loan agreement again. It's very important that you know exactly what's happening to your loan because the majority of lenders have no rate cap on that first adjustment, meaning that your rate can adjust to the full margin plus the index. I had a client that just called me about that last week. I, we looked at their loan documents and it was, you know, 225, I think over the five year treasury or something like that. So the rate was going to be like 7.6 from 4%. And they had no idea. So now they're looking at the at the possibility of having to refinance next year when uh, the rate's set to adjust because the rate is so much higher than what they thought. There was no cap on that first adjustment. So double check that, you guys. Um, I just don't want anybody to get stuck or get shocked with their payment when their loan is set to adjust. Your lender most likely will send you a letter, but that's usually about 30 days before the loan adjusts. So you just don't want to get caught and, you know, have to scramble. You want to basically, you know, understand where you're at, understand what's going to happen and make an educated decision move to move forward. So anyways, have a fabulous week. Thank you guys so much. I hope you like this data that I pulled for you. I found it super interesting and I'm going to be tracking it month over month. So that way we can see how the tides are turning. Um, so if there's anything else you want to see, feel free to give me a call and reach out. Uh, have a great week and I'll see you next week.